At a motel in Colorado, Deborah Jean and Tweener share an intimate moment inside their motel room. The two face each other in bed, talking about how they want their future to be like. Deborah Jean wants to keep on driving, feeling regretful that they are close to Utah, her hometown. Shortly after, a police officer comes knocking on her door. Panicked, Tweener retreats to the bathroom to hide while Deborah Jean talks to the officer. Deborah Jean grows shocked as the police officer shows her a mugshot of Tweener. She immediately recognizes the photo, but nonetheless lies to the officer and denies that she has seen him. After the police officer leaves, Deborah Jean turns quiet as she eyes Tweener suspiciously. Tweener rushes to explain to Deborah Jean, saying that he is not like the other murderers in Fox River 8. In reply, Deborah Jean tells him that she will be going for a walk and will leave her keys inside. She hints to Tweener that he can use her car to escape, but that they have to part ways from there. Before Deborah Jean heads out, Tweener regrettably tells her how he wished they met under different circumstances. As planned, Tweener uses Deborah Jean's car, saddened and frustrated that he had to leave her behind. He writes a parting message for her, before abandoning the car in the outskirts of Utah. Tweener then walks the remaining miles into Tuil, where he eventually comes across Teabag. Teabag corners Tweener and suggests that they work together, to which Tweener strongly refuses. While the brothers Michael and Lincoln are driving towards Salt Lake City in Utah, they hear about the radio report on John Abruzzi's death. Lincoln feels the need to rush, suggesting that they head to Arizona instead to pick up LJ and straight to Panama. Michael grows upset and reminds him that they need Westmoreland's money first because they can't do anything without it. Soon, the brothers reach Tuil, a small town in Utah where Westmoreland's money is apparently buried. They walk around looking for a double key ranch, but to no avail. While Lincoln begins to doubt whether Westmoreland was telling the truth about the money, Michael insists on checking the municipal building for property records. The brothers carefully sneak inside, almost recognized by the police officers. Michael checks a book of old maps containing all the important details of topography in Utah. He discovers the meaning behind the Double K Ranch, a land which belongs to a person named Carl Kokosing. Michael goes through the pages, looking for Carl Kokosing's map 1213, but finds the page ripped off. As the two suspect that someone got to the map first, they look outside and see Teabag walking nearby. Lincoln and Michael corner Teabag to get the map but Teabag says that he doesn't have the map in him. He explains that he and Tweener are working together and that Tweener has the map. While Michael and Lincoln look for Tweener, they lock Teabag inside the trunk of their vehicle. In the meantime, Tweener is on his way to the equipment store to purchase a shovel. The local who owns the store recognizes his face and hits him with a baseball bat. He pulls Tweener into his storage area to turn him into the authorities and get the reward. Michael and Lincoln enter the store shortly after, rescuing Tweener from the local. They release Tweener and lock the local inside the storage area. Lincoln forces Tweener to hand over the map, but Tweener reveals that Teabag is the one who has it. When the three of them come back to their car, they learn that Teabag has memorized the map and already ate it. Teabag taunts Michael, informing them that he is now the only person who knows where Westmoreland's money is. Teabag proposes a supposedly beneficial arrangement for them, in which Michael and Lincoln will give Teabag a fair share of the money in exchange for telling them the location. Michael and Lincoln are then forced to take the deal, allowing Teabag to sit behind them. Tweener, however, is forced to stay inside the trunk while they drive to Carl Kosing's land. When they arrive at the location, Teabag, Michael, and Lincoln walk the rest of the way, only to find out that there is no longer a cello, but instead a subdivision. Meanwhile, Agent Kellerman meets with Agent Kim, his new superior, regarding the status of his mission. Kim is puzzled why Kellerman chose to keep watch of Sarah Tancredi, stating doubts about his decision. In defense, Kellerman explains that Sarah is in contact with Michael, which will lead them to Lincoln's location. Before driving away, Kellerman firmly tells Agent Kim that he reports to President Caroline Reynolds directly. But then, Agent Kim insists on contacting her. Around the same time, Sarah is checking her mail before leaving her apartment. She finds an envelope with a handwritten text, curiously ripping it open. She finds a swan origami with a set of numbers written on its wings. During her meeting with her support group in Narcotics Anonymous, Sarah finds herself fiddling at the swan origami. Right after the meeting, Kellerman, who currently poses as Lance, approaches Sarah and invites her to dinner. Sarah politely turns him down thinking that Kellerman is making a move on her. In reply, Kellerman explains that his partner, Daniel, is still away for a business trip and that he only wants to have dinner. Feeling guilty, she invites Kellerman to her apartment instead. 
Back in her apartment, Sarah leaves a message to her father, Governor Frank Tancredi, to apologize for her wrongdoings. Shortly after, Kellerman arrives in her apartment, carrying a paper bag of ingredients for their dinner. While the two are having dinner, Governor Frank appears in Sarah's apartment. As Sarah introduces Kellerman to his father Frank, Kellerman insists on leaving but they let him stay. Sarah and Governor Frank then head into her kitchen to talk. She apologizes to Frank, later explaining that she was not fully aware of the consequences of her actions. Sarah assures him that she is fine, but that she is scared, prompting Frank to give her a comforting hug. Meanwhile, Kellerman looks around Sarah's apartment and scans through her mail. He discovers the swan origami and copies the series of numbers written on its wing. Kellerman has the number checked in an instant, which happens to be a phone number that has been long disconnected. Later in Governor Frank's office, he decides to finally read Lincoln's case file. His advisor comes in to remind him about his flight to Washington, D.C., and finds Governor Frank examining the files. Governor Frank's advisor warns him about Lincoln's case, telling him that Lincoln's lawyer, Nick Saverin, is already dead and his lead counsel, Veronica Donovan, is classified as missing. As Frank asks him questions, his advisor suggests he stops asking if he really wants the vice president position. Despite his curiosity, Frank tosses the case file back to the table and leaves for his flight. 100 miles outside Las Vegas, Nevada, Sucre drives a motorcycle on his way to stop Maracruz and Hector's wedding. He goes to the payphone, calling to check their location, until he finds the right chapel. Sucre barges into the bride's room, where he finds Maracruz's sister, Theresa. Theresa tells Sucre that Maracruz is out taking pictures with their parents, ordering him to wait. Sucre pleads with Theresa to let him see Maracruz, and Theresa seemingly heads out to call Maracruz. To his surprise, however, Hector appears at the door. Enraged, Sucre grabs Hector on the collar as he pulls him inside. Sucre fumingly tells Hector that he will never allow him to raise their child. Hector only grins at him, until the sound of a police siren is heard approaching the chapel. He later mocks Sucre, saying that Maracruz won't choose him because she will not want to live her life always on the run. Sucre knocks Hector unconscious after realizing that he called the police and betrayed him again. He then rushes out of the bride's room looking for Maracruz, but Theresa urges him to go. She tells Sucre that Maracruz knows he came, and he pulls his crucifix necklace off his neck to give it to Theresa. He runs out of the chapel and rides his motorcycle just before the police officers reach the chapel. Sucre reaches a gasoline station one mile from the Nevada and Utah border. He decides to stop by and fill up his gas tank, still saddened that he could not stop Maracruz and Hector's wedding. In Green River, Wyoming, C-Note sneaks into a train on his way to Utah. When a ticket inspector comes to check their tickets, C-Note brings out a torn ticket stub and makes up an excuse, barely convincing him. After a while, he borrows a laptop from his seatmate and uses his access to the United States Army Signal Corp website. He searches for the Double K Ranch and succeeds at finding the coordinates leading to Westmoreland's money. Just then, the ticket inspector returns to inform him that his ticket is invalid. C-Note protests, but the inspector tells him that he will be sent out of the train by police officers at the next train station. Wanting to avoid the police officers, C-Note runs off, leaving the train as he jumps out and into a river. He manages to escape and is able to reach Utah on foot with the same intention of finding Westmoreland's money. C-Note sneaks to someone's yard in an attempt to freshen himself with water, but the owner interrupts him. He subtly asks the owner about the RV she is selling. The owner is reluctant to tell him, claiming that it is out of his price range. After much convincing, the owner reveals the amount and C-Note assures her that he will come back to pay for the RV in a couple of days. Back in Chicago, the FBI field office remains busy, still working to locate the seven inmates of the Fox River 8. Mahone grows displeased as the other agents have no updates on Schofield. Later, a technician informs Mahone that he has recovered about 60% of the data in Michael's hard drive. Most of the documents retrieved are news clippings and articles on D.B. Cooper. Throughout the day, Mahone strives to trace out the movements of the seven remaining inmates. His hand starts shaking, so he takes out his bulb and container to grab a pill. To his dismay, he learns that he has run out of pills. After a while, Mahone meets with a young man outside of the office. The young man happens to be a seller of his pills and at the same time his informant regarding information on Oscar Shales. After the young man gives him a refill, he asks Mahone if he is still looking for more information on Oscar Shales. Agitated, Mahone does not answer and instead orders him to go away, getting the payment for the pills. He takes a pill immediately, prompting his hands to stop shaking. With newfound strength, Mahone gets back to work. As he tracks the movement of the seven inmates, Mahone notices that the majority of them are heading to Utah. He recalls the article of D.B. Cooper, who turns out to be Charles Westmoreland, a fellow inmate who tried to escape with the Fox River 8. 
Mahone figures out that the escaped inmates know where Westmoreland buried his money, which he suspects is in Utah. Some time later, Mahone is in his home, staring intently at his birdbath, before leaving for his flight to Utah.